Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network and host of the African History Network show. I'm here with one of our esteemed scholars when it comes to African history, African American history. Uh, you've heard him on the African History Network show before. I'm talking about the one and only Dr. Malefe Keti Asante. Hotep, brother, how you doing today? Hotep, young Hotep, I'm very, I'm very good. I'm, I'm blessed, uh, and I'm ready to be on this very popular show. Uh, yes, we, we've certainly heard you, heard about your work and appreciate the work that you're doing. It's essential. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, as well as with you, man, and uh, I've been inspired by you. Uh, also, uh, the, probably the first time I saw you on TV was on Tony Brown's journal <laughs> yeah, back, in, wow. <laughs> back wow. in the early 1990s, man. <laughs> you were one of the few people who remember that. But oh, Tony, Tony, Tony had me on periodically. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Tony Brown's Journal, and yeah, yeah. I grew up watching Tony Brown's Journal because my parents watched it. Yeah, so mean, that's how I learned about them. Every Sunday, four p.m. I think it's four or five cool. p.m. PBS yeah. here in Detroit. That's how I learned about I, you. I, I love. It. <laughs> All right, so um, you uh, many people have seen the interviews I've done with Anthony Browder as yeah. well as Dr. Charles Finch, yes. and we were talking about the uh, documentary from mm -hmm. uh, executive producer Jada Pickett Smith is in mm -hmm. the African Queens series. Mm -hmm. It's on Netflix and the trailer dealing with the installment uh, dealing with Queen Cleopatra the seventh caused a lot of controversy, a lot of uh, Arab back, Arab, Arab backlash, anti-African backlash, things like this. Um, so it, it, it came out May 10th, 2023. I've seen it. Uh, and I thought it was fantastic. I know you did a lecture recently dealing with Queen Cleopatra, this documentary and the Arab uh, uh, anti-blackness backlash, things like this. So I want to have this conversation uh, with you today on this topic. So uh, let me ask you a question, brother. Have you seen this documentary yet on no, uh, Netflix? I have not seen the documentary. OK, and, and so my issue is not uh, my issue is not the. Uh, the, the documentary uh, per se. I mean, and I would like to see it. I mean, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm not opposed to see it. I want to see it. Yes. But that's not the issue. The issue is, for me, a problem of uh, racial hatred of yes. African people uh, as expressed by the uh, Arab indignation about an uh, African woman playing the role of Cleopatra. That's, yes. that's the issue. The issue is... Uh, it is time for African people to resist uh, the incredible uh, encroachment of, uh, of Arab nationalism on mm -hmm. African culture and the attempt to erase African people from Africa's own history, particularly on the land of Africa itself. So right. it's a serious problem, and it's not just a problem of uh, a movie. It, it is actually what's happening in Sudan right now. It's the same mm -hmm. issue. I mean, right. the, the Arab stations are saying that uh, uh, that Sudan is an original part of Arabia, of course. So this is what they're saying today, yesterday. Right. So, so in Arabic, they are having a, a, a real strong uh, resistance uh, to Africa asserting itself. And I'm, I'm, of course, one of those people who believe that uh, we have to resist any attempt to falsify the record of African history. So, so that's, that's where this debate comes with me, to, uh, how, how to deal with this uh, question uh, and, and, and how to raise this question in a proper context so that African people, not just here in the diaspora, but also on the continent of Africa, uh, began to take up uh, uh, their own intellectual and scholarly arms to fight against uh, this encroachment. And we right. have to do that. And part of our confusion as African people, to a large degree, over the last four or 500 years, and even before that, uh, really that part of that confusion has been because of the uh, Arabization, just like it has been the Europeanization. Mm -hmm. of African people and African cultures. So, so we, 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 we've got to adjust to that. And I think that we have, we've slept enough. It's time for us to wake up. Okay, we've slept enough. It's time for us to wake up. Um, 
And I, I've looked at a lot of the different um, comments, uh, the backlash coming from from Arabs uh, in who are in Egypt today, who are what are referred to as modern day Egyptians. Um, and I know in uh, your lecture, you made the distinction between Egyptian being citizenship as in the modern term uh, Egyptian today and understanding an Egyptian in the past when it would be what we would call uh, ancient Kemet, uh, Kemet, things of this nature. Talk, can you talk about that nuance for a minute? I, I think that's a very uh, wonderful observation. Yeah, I can talk about it quite uh, specifically. Uh, what the uh, Arab population has largely done in Kemet in Egypt is to hijack the term Egyptian. That's basically what they have tried to do. Yes. And, and the idea is that uh, the way they have done it is very interesting. Interesting, because what they have done is to claim that ancient Egypt was the same as contemporary Egypt. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, that, that is not true. I mean, that's just false on the very face of it. I mean, almost anybody can see that. And I've said this, you know, when I've talked about uh, the American situation, I've told people that uh, 500 years ago, uh, the land that we call the uh, United States of America didn't look like it does today right. in terms of the diversity of the people. Uh, so that to claim that uh, Egyptian uh, today is the same as Egyptian, uh, the Egyptians who built the pyramids or who Egyptians who... Uh, who, who built the temples and the tombs uh, and uh, created writing is, is a false thing. And not only is it false, but it also disrespects the black people who are direct descendants of those ancient Egyptians who still live in Egypt. So right. it's like, wait a minute. I mean, we're still here. It's like, it's almost like uh, you white Americans saying basically the Pueblos in New Mexico were created by Europeans. The right. Americans are still the people who the now the DNA people who created them are still here. Exactly. So it, it's a very uh, weird kind of situation. And years ago, uh, one of the great uh, Nigerian philosophers, uh, Chinwezu, warned us that this was coming. He he anticipated that what there would be would be a very strong attempt on the part of Arab nationalists to in fact redefine the Nile Valley civilization as Arab civilization. And okay. of course, we are seeing this encroachment uh, day by day. And, 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 and Jada uh, Pinkett Smith did a profound assertion and her production crew did a pro profound uh, pro uh, uh, assertion that was based uh, as much on fact as anybody else could have done. I mean, and I think that that is the thing. I mean, we we have every um, indication uh, that uh, Cleopatra, we, we know, well, first of all, we know, first of all, that Cleopatra was not German. We know right. she was not English. We right. know she was not Arab. In fact, we, we know that we don't even have an Arab population in Kemet in large numbers until uh, the, the seventh century, right. uh, uh, this era. So, so we, we, we know the, these facts. I mean, and you have a guy like uh, Zawhi uh, Hawaz, mm -hmm. who basically is a salesperson. That's what I call him. He is a, he's a, he's, he has now tried to rehab have himself by uh, because he got into difficulty before. And now he's trying to rehab himself by being a, se a salesperson for tourism in Egypt. That's what he does. That's his only thing. And so to do that, he often has to tell things that are untrue and say things that are not correct. And right. he, he did that in Philadelphia. We demonstrated against him when he came to Philadelphia for that. When was this? This was uh, several years ago when they had the King... Uh, Tarek Amman uh, exhibition at, okay. at our Franklin Museum. We 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 had we we, we 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 it was it was it was wonderful because he was he was cornered by an African American woman reporter Helen Blue, 
and okay. said to him, she said to him, M uh, Mr. Hawaz, why do you keep saying uh, that uh, King Tut was not black? Was he black? And then mm -hmm. he simply, out of exasperation, said, yes, he was black. So leave me alone, basically. You see what I'm right. saying? Right. So, right. so then what I've, <laughs> I've followed him. I've watched his, his work. His work is right. to, his work is, is to, to, be, to be drama for, for Egypt. And, and the drama for Egypt uh, really creates excitement in uh, European countries. For, well, I need to go and see what Hawass has seen. He's king. right, but there are no Arabs in in uh, ancient Egypt. There's no there's no population of them. Cleopatra right. could never have been an Arab. That's not that was not possible. You see, exactly, so this exactly. Is, this is a okay. very very uh, strange situation, and the, and and the smartest thing. And I wrote this in my book. I wrote a book called Culture and Customs of of Egypt. And this book okay. published uh, several years ago, maybe 15 to 20 years ago. And I tried to put this business to rest at that time. And for a long time, I thought we had really solved this issue uh, with history. It, this is a historical situation. It's not a, a situation that black people are having some opinion about something. This is, this is a historical fact, you know? So let's deal with the historical facts. Uh, and, and, and and that's what I, I've tried to do with the whole question of uh, Cleopatra, uh, you see. Right, exactly. Um, so I, I want to uh, show this timeline of history here just very briefly for people who may not be familiar with this information. And um, and then I, I want to show you a couple uh, articles here because I've been dealing with this uh, on the African History Network show as well. And, you know, I'll have people who I guess they're Arabs who will, you know, make these anti-black statements and different things of this nature. But um, uh, first off, if we look here, let me uh, uh, flip over here. OK, so this is a timeline of uh, dealing with the global African history that I use. This one here is from past.org, blackpast.org. They have about 6,000 pages of articles dealing with African history and um, African-American history. But if we just look at this here uh, uh, briefly, okay, so 332 BC, that's an important um, date that we need to understand. 332 BCE, before the common era, uh, you have t uh, Alexander the Greek or Alexander the Great, uh, he uh, conquers uh, Egypt, okay? And then we know he dies in 320, uh, 323 B.C. And uh, one of his generals, Ptolemy I, Soter Lagi, becomes um, uh, ruler of Egypt. OK, when we look at uh, we go down, we don't see the Arabs come in until 639 A.D. OK, now Cleopatra the seventh was born in 69 B.C. B.C.E before the common era, 69 BCE. So she's born about uh, close to 700 years before the Arabs invade in uh, Egypt, all right? So what I saw in some videos, like on social media, some like comment, comments, things like this, Arabs who are there today, who whose citizenship is Egyptian, were claiming that black people were trying to steal their heritage or and, and uh, it's, it's go a, ahead it's the direct opposite yes <laughs> no 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 it's not black people trying to steal arab uh, uh, heritage it's, right. it's the arab trying to steal the black people's heritage That's exactly no, no come on no 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 you know it's very it's very it's it's one of these weird worlds i mean yes in, in fact uh, what what we have to say, and this is very interesting, and I've I had this I've had this debate for forty years, with many people uh, of uh, fr from that part of the world. Uh, what we have to say is that there was conquest. This yeah. is true. That is correct. The Arabs did uh, come in, and uh, with the and they came in actually at the invitation of African people. The yes. African people asked the Arabs to come in and help them throw off the Romans because after mm -hmm. the death of Cleopatra, 
the Romans took over and they took charge of uh, Kemet. And, uh, yes. and, uh, and after so many uh, uh, hundred years, uh, the, the Arab military was growing strong because of Islam. They had, uh, they had, they had made, bat battled many people and conquered many people. So they were asked to come and help throw off the Romans, which they did. And the general yes. was called Amir El Az. El Az yes. stayed. He, he decided that Egypt was a good place. <laughs> Why go back to the desert? This is a very, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in the fertile territory of the Nile River. Let's just stay here. And then, of course, brought many, many Arab people into Egypt. And that began the domination of the culture and the enforcement, of course, of the Islamic religion. But it was the Arab uh, conquest of Egypt that uh, really uh, uh, created this whole uh, uh, commercial notion of, of right. taking over the uh, creative uh, innovations of African people and claiming them as Arab creations. Arabs didn't build the pyramids, Arabs didn't build right. the tombs, they didn't build the temples, they didn't create writing. None of that is attributable to the Arab population. Exactly. And, and it's, it's important to note that um, the ancient Kemetic people, the ancient Kemites, they stopped building pyramids in the uh, toward the end of the sixth dynasty okay they stopped building pyramids somewhere around 2300 bc something like that okay long before the arabs come in yeah. long before the romans come absolutely. in long before the greeks come absolutely in. absolutely absolutely you know and, and if we if we if we really want to deal with it um even before the people called hebrews was said to have come into mm -hmm. Egypt, the, the Africans have stopped building pyramids mm -hmm. also. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so this is so, so this so, so this is this is all about uh, and this is why I think your channel is a good channel uh oh, African you. history. I mean we, it's all about correcting these uh impressions that were based on the idea that African people had been conquered, that we had been enslaved, and so people took advantage of yes. the situation that African people found themselves in. And that meant that uh, for, at least for those of us in the US, for 246 years, people could write anything they wanna write about us because we, we were right. not writing uh, in large numbers and we were not reading in large numbers. You see, that's right. Yes. And, yes. Um, and then the Arab uh, conquest of Kemet and the attempted conquest, and they still had it in Sudan, and, uh, and my ancestors trace uh, to Sudan on one right. of my uh, on my mother's side. So when you start talking about the whole uh, situation of the Nile Valley, the idea is how do you take that away from from Africa? But that's the attempt. The attempt, is, and so by Arabizing African people to make right. them think that they are Arabs, they have created this internal situation where you have fighting and factions going on in uh, in places like Sudan and in uh, still in southern Egypt as well as uh, in Chad and, and Niger and so on those those areas are uh, volatile and they're volatile because there's some people who say well I don't mind being Muslim but I don't want to be an Arab you know I, I, I have I have my own language I have my own grandmother my own grandfather but they want to make me an Arab and they want to change my name, change my language and do all of that. But the people are saying, you know, let me be if you want, if you say that I'm a Muslim, yeah, I'm a Muslim. That's fine. But don't make mm -hmm. me an Arab that and don't say that I'm Arab and don't punish me because I don't take your name or be, I don't use your your language and so forth. So this is a question of the notion of. Arab supremacy over African people. This is why right. it is all, it's almost like it's, um, it's not inherent, but it is uh, endemic to the Arab notion of the relationship between Africans and Arab people. And that notion is that African people are below Arabs. That, that is, the, right. that's, and that's a negative notion that cannot be allowed to exist in the 21st century. And we have to, we have to fight it. And this is why 
I, uh, I, I, I came out with a lecture on, on Jada uh, Pinkett uh, Smith because whatever celebrities are brave enough, uh, like um, Kevin Hart or her, to play yes. these kind of things, and they're not scholars. They just, they just, they just know what the general uh, uh, plausibility is. I mean, what's probable? I mean, the fact that right. uh, Cleopatra, for example, uh, uh, was a descendant of a Greek leader. Uh, uh, doesn't mean much after 300 years. I mean, mm -hmm. It's almost like I was telling somebody, and I said this uh, often, that in, in my own family, uh, I, I have people who maybe four generations ago uh, had white paternity, some, some white right. man in the family. But they're not, if you look at them today, they're not white. So you can right. have Greek paternity 300 years ago and still your complexion today will be black. You see what I'm saying? So we don't, mm -hmm. th that's a debate that uh, is ridiculous. It's, 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 it doesn't make any sense to me. And some people say, well, right. she was of Greek descent. Yeah. And so, and uh, Henry Louis Gates says 30% of all African Americans have white paternity. They are of white right. descent because of the, of the rape of the enslaved African women on the plantations. So you got right. 30% of us have that, but today we don't go around saying we're white. This is not a, that's not a, well, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, so, it, uh, we, most of us don't. Yeah, yeah. most of us don't. <laughs> <laughs> some, some, some of us may I, think I, white, I, like Clarence yeah. Thomas, but you, you know. Correct, but, you were very correct. Most of us, I, I get your point, said, though. <laughs> but you're you right. You, I can't get too passionate about this. <laughs> because because you're right, I I, I I can be proven wrong on that. But I, well, you know, <laughs> I think basically what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. the debate about what complexion Cleopatra is, I mean, right. it, the plausible thing, the most likely thing is that she was number one of dark complexion. That's that's mm -hmm. most plausible, given the fact that uh, she uh, that the Greeks were just a ruling class in, um, in, in Kemet at the time. And they ruled for 300 years, at least that particular right. family ruled for 300 years. But that particular family, as a Greek family, I am sure, I don't know, but I am sure they had African people in that family. They had to have, they're in an African country. They are surrounded by African people. They are they're right. ruling and, and serving and working and, and fighting in the army that's basically African army. Why, why, wait a minute. And you're telling me for 300 years, this pure Greek white family ruled in Egypt and there were no blackness in there? No, that's not true. And in fact, right. Arsenoe, the fourth, mm -hmm. who was Cleopatra's right. sister, has been proven to be of African descent. So exactly, I'm gonna show an article yeah, that, that deals yeah, with that. Absolutely, yeah. the BBC had a documentary dealing with absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now, our center way the fourth is depicted in the documentary Cleopatra from Jada Pinkett Smith. Also, oh, okay, great. He's depicted oh, in there. Yeah, I need to see that. Yeah, absolutely. It's on Netflix. It's about I think something like two hours, two and a half hours. It's fantastic. Right. I, so for for the sake of time, because I know I know you're short yeah, on I'm time. Sorry, uh, I got another point, man. I, yeah. Okay, he made, he made time to come on. We were trying to get him on last week, yeah, but he was yeah, in and out of town, so it was hectic. Uh, let's do this. I, I want to show uh, this article briefly. This is from NBCnews.com. This was one of the strongest statements against the documentary from the Egyptian government. The name of this article is uh, Cleopatra Was Not Black, Egypt Tells Netflix in Growing Feud, ahead of new series now first of all i just want to make it clear the the documentary series is not saying that cleopatra was black as as was say queen t or queen nefertiti or nefertari or anything like this what it's saying was basically she was melanated and she and she looked more like adele james who portrayed Cleopatra in this series and adele james is biracial she's a, a black british actress she uh, they, they were saying that uh, Cleopatra looked more like Adele James than she would have uh, uh, Elizabeth Taylor in 1963 in the movie uh, Cleopatra. Okay, That's correct. This, this is the argument that they're making. But if we just look here just at a couple of quick here, um, 
It says here, let's see, go to the, the government statement issued Thursday marked an escalation in a feud that has sparked demands for the show's cancellation amid a broader debate over representation and popular culture. Uh, and if we look here, it, okay, Egypt has accused, let's back up, Egypt has accused Netflix of misrepresenting history by casting a black woman to play Cleopatra, its most famous historical figure in a new series. Um, Queen Cleopatra, which is released uh, May 10th, features Adele James in the lead role, a casting decision that the streaming giant Netflix says, quote, is a nod to the centuries long conversation about the ruler's race, but which officials, end quote, but which officials in Cairo have dismissed as, quote unquote, blatant, historical fallacy blatant well, historical I, fallacy go ahead yeah well i, I i'm not uh, in in the um business necessarily of uh always supporting netflix but i want to say sure. well, this, in this case netflix was correct mm -hmm. and, and and the audiences who have decided not to see this uh film are 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 missing out on something from what i understand uh, yes. because of this controversy. But the Egyptian government is wrong. No government can take some sort of action to try to dictate history. And that's basically what they're doing. This is a very fascistic uh, operation. I've been to Egypt 10 or 12 times. I've taken mm -hmm. hundreds of people to Egypt. And I've, I've seen uh, the, the, e Egypt. So it, it, is, it is very, very uh, difficult. In fact, right now, Egyptians are writing me saying they disagree with the government. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I yes. got people writing me saying, because I made this statement and I'll make it here. I have rarely seen an Arab uh, progressive who speaks out against racism against black people in Egypt or right. in Sudan. I've not seen that. I've seen Europeans who are progressives, who right. spoke it out against white supremacy. But I don't see the Arabs doing that. And, 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 and so this Arab wrote me from Germany. Yes, I'm one of the ones who speak out. But I still have not seen any indication of this. You see, right. I haven't seen any real fact. So in this situation, Netflix is, is correct to take artistic license to do this. And they are more on a solid historical base and foundation than the Egyptian government because the Egyptian government is simply trying to promote Arab nationalism against the uh, historical black foundation of the ancient Egyptian government. Right. And, and they're also trying to promote tourism as well. Absolutely. And, and tourism took Absolutely. a hit during COVID-19. But also their tourism has taken a hit with the Russian invasion of Ukraine as well. Absolutely. Because the Russians were big people right. uh, in, in, in the tourist business. When you would go, you would see a lot of the Russians. But now to say that uh, ancient, uh, that Cleopatra was black, uh, oh my goodness! <laughs> the Europeans say, ah, "I'm not going to go to Egypt anymore." Yeah. Yep. But... Oh, yep. Even just, even just to put, even just to have a biracial woman portraying yeah. her and just yeah. saying that Cleopatra yeah. had melanin is yeah. scaring the hell out of people. Yeah. yeah. Because <laughs> because the white imaginary of Egypt, of course, is as you say, right? Is uh, is, is white? Is, is, is right? Is, is white it's, it's Ten Commandments. It's ten you know? Commandments. That's right. <laughs> And, and, and of course, even, even in the Ten Commandments, they they don't they don't they don't have at least they don't go with Cleopatra as an Arab. You see, they, mm -hmm. they at least the European <laughs> Europeans put her in as an English woman, you know, right? A British woman. So, but we still we we but this. Well, they show Nefertari. They, absolutely. Uh, 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 Ram, uh, with Ramses, they, yeah. they show Nefertari as a white woman. Yeah, yeah it, exactly. It, it, Absolutely. So this is what is going on. But I, I think we have to we, we have to do a number of things. Maulana Karenga used to say that Cleopatra was a, was basically unremarkable as a leader anyway. Mm -hmm. So so it is a big controversy. But if you start talking about Queen Ty or Hatshepsut, yes. this we're talking about great leaders as right. well, great women who had power and who exercised power. So Beckenfru. Uh, yep. And other women who were uh, uh, leaders in their own right, Amanarensis, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Nubian uh, uh, queen who stopped Augustus from taking over uh, Nubia and so forth. So there, there are many, many other issues. But I think 
that this issue here is basically an issue that is anti-African. That's basically what it is. And yeah. I think that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, we just have to keep saying, look, no Arab was ever a, a pariah, a pharaoh uh, in Egypt. No Arab was ever, uh, 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 could ever be uh, uh, Cleopatra, because that was not true. Even if you say she had Greek descent, she right. also uh, uh, most likely had African uh, ancestry as well. And, right. uh, and then we, we also know that Arabic is not indigenous to, to Africa as a language. It's not, it's an African language now, just like English is an African language now. Right. And French, but uh, it, it was not an African language. Absolutely. Uh, th this article here, because I, I was on um, K, uh, KBLA 1580 AM, which is Tavis Smiley's radio station in Southern California. I was on this past Tuesday on the Danny Morrison show. And one of the things we talked about was this uh, this documentary series and some of the history of Queen Cleopatra the Seventh, etc. This article here from the Washington Post is a really good article by Bethany Butler. Was Cleopatra black? We're asking the wrong question. Now, one of the things I've talked about, I talked about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered, um, and and some other shows I've been on, and in my interviews with Tony Browder as well as Dr. Anthony Finch. The the con the the racial classification of black and white are contemporary uh, terms. Absolutely. Contemporary classification, 17th century, 18th century, things like this. Back at this time, 69 BC, they don't have those classifications. Absolutely. Okay? So, so it's just important to, to understand that nuance. But yes. uh, uh, something very, so, you know, we're trying to look at, a lot of people are trying to look at this history from over 2,000 years ago through the contemporary lens of race today. Yes. But uh, something very important in this article is a statement uh, from uh, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith. And it's on uh, Netflix's uh, companion website called Tudum, T-U-D-U-M. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's on this, uh, the third page here. I'm going to go to this because it helps clear up a lot of this confusion. Because even in the documentary series, once again, they're not saying Cleopatra was black. More so, they're saying she wasn't white. OK, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it's uh, let's see here. Pinkett Smith told Netflix's companion website to them that the goal of African Queens with the, the documentary series African Queens, which launched earlier this year, 2023, with a look at the 17th century ruler in Jenga or in Zynga. That was uh, that was good. Also, that one was to share underrepresented stories about historical women who were so powerful and were the backbone of African nations. Um, she said, we don't often get to see or hear stories about black queens. And that was really important for me as well as for my daughter and just for my community to be able to know those stories because these are tons of them, because there are tons of them, Jada Pinkett Smith said. Uh, comment on that uh, for a minute. And there's another quote that I want to get to. Go ahead, brother. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that she, she should definitely write. I mean, I, I don't, uh, and I think that the whole question of what is, uh, I mean, when you start talking about Africanity, mm -hmm. uh, the, the argument that is most likely uh, to be sustainable is that uh, Cleopatra was certainly an African uh, woman. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're in uh, Africa for 300, your, your ancestors are in Africa for 300 years. Right. But you, 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 you are culturally a, a, an African person. And uh, I think that the um, ancient, uh, uh, you know, Greeks were very interesting because they did not try to appropriate Egypt at first. They, they, right. they came from Egypt. They they learn, and in fact, they they wanted they they in, in fact, you know, Alexander himself. I mean, uh, three hundred years earlier than Cleopatra, uh, uh, wanted uh, the oracles of of, of Kemet uh, to recognize him as one of the sons of God. I mean, this is this is very right. Alexander. Traditional, you see, yeah. So, so, so the, so it's not the. So I'm. We don't have an argument with the Greeks, and even the contemporary Greeks don't argue these issues. Right. This is the Arab issue. This is Arab. This is Arab imperialism in Africa, 
and uh, Dr. Sally Ann Ashton, a PhD from Cambridge and an Egyptologist has, has argued that most of these arguments are, are agendas of white supremacy. But I argue that this is an agenda of Arab supremacy. The idea is we cannot, they don't, number one, they basically have uh, uh, persecuted, oppressed, suppressed, and, uh, and brutalized African people, dark-skinned right. people in Egypt and in Sudan. And now the, 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 they cannot stand the fact that in the, on the American nation, on the American side, that Africa, a woman of African descent has said what is correct, that, hey, wait a minute, I am uh, I'm suggesting that this African queen uh, is uh, significant as an African person. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and we come in all complexions. I mean, as right. <laughs> we, we're the most diverse uh, a group of people on the face of the earth. I mean, in right. Africa, I've seen all kinds of people in Africa. You know, this is, this is African population is is light it's dark it's uh brown it's red it's, it's yellow it's we we have everything on the continent and it's exactly travel, they will see this there's no argument why is there an argument there's only an argument because this is a person who uh this uh because uh jada pinkett uh, uh smith has said uh, and her production people have said look this actress is represents Cleopatra. And I think it's uh, just as legitimate and more legitimate than having Elizabeth Taylor to do it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, lastly here, and then I'm going to uh, give you a website and let people uh, let you tell people how they can contact you. Uh, this is the uh, article I was looking for. Now, this just came out May 12, 2023. CNN.com. Queen Cleopatra actress Adele James talks blackwashing, quote unquote, blackwashing. And in here, uh, we scroll down, it talks about how um, her uh, um, her ethnicity is now. This is a statement from the producers of the documentary. Uh, her ethnicity is not the focus of Queen Cleopatra, the documentary series, but we did intentionally decide to depict her of mixed ethnicity to reflect theories about Cleopatra's possible Egyptian ancestry. And the and the multicultural nation na nature of ancient Egypt. Okay, talk talk about that for a minute because at the time they yeah. even say this in the documentary. At the time that Cleopatra was born, the populations that are there in Egypt are the the indigenous African people, um, the Greeks, and they also talk about Hebrews or Jews being there. I, I I I I would not have written a statement like that because okay. uh, you know it's just like it, when I go to France mm -hmm. I mean, and I see a, a whole lot of African people in France in Paris, but I wouldn't say I mean it, France is a white nation. You know right. what I'm saying? It's like you go to Australia, you see uh, people from Asia and people from Papua New Guinea and. Everywhere, but Australia is a white nation. Mm -hmm. So, so, so ancient Kemet in 300 uh, BC mm -hmm. was a black nation. Yes, it was. It was conquered by Alexander's army, and they imposed a Greek rulership over that o black nation. Over a black nation, right? Yes, right. Don't, don't confuse matters. It became more multi ethnic later as okay. more Greeks came as 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 later uh, in the Romans era the Roman yes and the Persians or, and the many people came but the further you go back was the black of the country is. oh correct yes absolutely absolutely all right um I Thank know you, you I know you're short on time brother yeah. Tell people how they can contact you. And then we've got your website that I'm going to pull up right here as well. Let okay. people know how they can t contact you if they want to bring you in, do a lecture or anything like that. Uh, thank you. Well, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. All right. But let me get tell you, my web, you got my website, maleficateasante.com. Yes. And you can also see our uh, our lectures at my at our think tank, the Maleficate Asante Institute. 
It's okay. The MKA Institute uh, lecture series. And uh, if you go to YouTube, you'll, you'll see our, our lectures as well. We appreciate you very much, Michael. Thank you. All right, brother. All right, brothers. Good to, good to uh, catch up with you. Good to talk to you again. Hotel. Good good. All right, hotel. Yeah, hotel. All right, brother. Peace. Peace. All right, everybody. He has to run. He has another commitment. Don't go anywhere. We have uh, more information for you as well. And I'm teaching a, uh, you know, on Saturdays, uh, I teach my online uh, history classes as well. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'a for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we have a session of that coming up at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, today, uh, May 20th, 2023. And uh, we'll give you information about that. And uh, we're going to do a free session of the class today. So you can register for that uh, at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. I'm going to post a link here. And uh, you can register for the full uh, 12 We Actually, it's about 14 weeks this time around. You can register for the full 14-week online course. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, et cetera. Uh, so that was Dr. Malefe Keti Asante that uh, we just spoke with. And uh, he was the uh, former, he used to be the chair of the uh, um, Afro-American Studies Department at uh, Temple University in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, he has written uh, over 100 uh, books dealing with African history, African American history, and probably about 500 articles or so um, as well. So he's one of our esteemed scholars. All right, how's everybody doing today? Uh, share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in uh, as well. And uh, go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have uh, information dealing with our uh, a radio show, the African History Network show, our classes, all that there. If you want to support the African History Network, you can do so. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us keep doing the research, keep broadcasting our Sunday night show. I'm on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. Um, so you can so uh, you can support us, uh, Cash App, PayPal. Uh, this is the interview I did with Tony Browder. Uh, follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. But on Saturdays, I teach Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So uh, the class is regularly $130. is on sale $60. You can register for the full course. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch them anytime, even a year from now, two years from now. You can go back and watch the entire course. Okay. We're going to do uh, so register for the full course. And we also would do a, a free class session today uh, as well. So we'll have that link available here in just a minute at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Now, on Sundays, uh, I teach Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. Uh, that class is 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we deal with history from 1800 to 1968. Okay. Fantastic class. We deal with history chronologically to understand what happened to us after uh, slavery ended. And what led up to the Civil War taking place? What were the laws and policies put in place after slavery ended? And uh, what brought us to where we are today to understand where we need to go from here? Uh, your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. I'm a historian. I'm studying history for 31 years. I'm also a political commentator as well. Uh, you see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered on, on Fridays. I was just on yesterday. Uh, so you see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered, as well as uh, for Raji Muhammad's show, The Culture. And uh, I'm there uh, providing historical analysis and uh, political analysis. All right. So um, give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like uh, on this broadcast. We posted the link. You can register for these online classes. We also have a bundle pack, uh, a course bundle. We can register for both classes for 
um, eighty dollars is discounted. That's a three hundred dollar value, and you can register for both classes uh, for um, eighty dollars right now. You can also use this information with your children. I would say the content is PG thirteen. Okay. All right. Now, uh, just to give you a brief overview uh, of this class that I teach, it developed from a four and a half hour lecture that I did in um, 2014 called Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, uh, what they didn't teach you in school. And it was that that lecture was the culmination of about seven, seven years of research. OK, but when we study the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start studying our history and slavery. We have to deal with the uh, 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we have to understand this history uh, chronologically, what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we can't start in uh, 1441 with uh, the Portuguese going into uh, Mauritania. Uh, we can't start in 1619 in uh, Virginia, okay, or Hampton, Virginia. We can't start there. And it's, it's also important to note that African people were in the land that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay, so uh, and you have to deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, because the Portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The Spanish are the second ones involved. And um, Columbus is using nautical instruments that's based upon technology that the Moors introduced into Europe. And the teachings that the Moors take into Europe are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. OK, and the Moors are taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into the Nile Valley region of Africa. And these teachings are going to save Europe. OK, and it, it and if it had not been for the teachings from the Moors, uh, a lot of uh, uh, probably millions more people would have died from the Black Death, the, the bubonic plague that hits uh, Europe and spurts from 1347. Uh, common era A.D. to 1400. So this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. All right. So uh, it's important for us to understand that African people are the original people of North, Central and South America and, and have been in the land that we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years ago. So we look at things, so there's seven books, about seven books that we use as a reference. And I show you excerpts of the book on the screen. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class. There's about um, 80 articles that we'll look at. We show that to you on the screen as well. Um, this book right here, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence from one of my friends, Dr. David M. Hotep. Many of you have seen the interviews I've done with Dr. David M. Hotep over the years. His book is backed up by 713 footnotes and seven peer-reviewed articles. On page 14 of his book, he deals with um, evidence. He deals with a discovery in Allendale County, South Carolina, uh, that documents an African presence in the Americas going back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay. Um, this was uh, discovered by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. They found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in the Americas dating back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, uh, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. This is long before the transatlantic slave trade. This, this does not mean that the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. It means that African people were here in this land that we call the United States of America 
as well as in the Americas, tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade started. And this is and this is why it's so important for us to understand this history, because if you think that you first came to this land, conquered and shackled and chained by Europeans. OK, then you're going to be psychologically damaged from that. This was no. The, the truth of the matter is this was our land stolen from us. African people were here even before Native Americans came into existence. So now this is an article from ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com uh, has articles dealing with uh, science, archaeological discoveries, different things like this. This is an article uh, about this discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made. Is from November 18, 2004. It's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And in the article, it says, uh, then th this is a summary of the article, okay? It says that radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains um, were where artifacts were unearthed last May. That would have been May 2023. Well, that would have been May 20, 2004, May 2004, along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least uh, 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America at least uh, uh, before the long before the last ice age, humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. OK, so who were these humans? Right now, these were the Khoisan. Who are the short statured Africans? Now, if we look here, uh, there was a article in Science magazine. An October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans. The Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common human ancestor. Um, the Khoisan formerly called uh, from our commonly uh, human ancestor. Okay. Now the Khoisan formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen are genetically unique. Now, when we look here, these are two Khoisan women. OK, the, the, the Khoisan are the short statute Africans. And uh, there's a good article from AtlantaBlackStar.com that talks about the Khoisan also. Uh, the Khoisan live in southern Africa in territory that is uh, territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into uh, two groups, hunters and gatherers, the Sans people, and uh, keepers of the livestock, the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds, the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. So read the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com called uh, Five Ethnic Groups. Uh, that proved the first humans were black. Okay. So we go through and look at these different archaeological discoveries, scientific discoveries. We did that, do that in the first two or three classes. Uh, this discovery here that came out in February 2010, this deals with uh, on the Greek island of Crete, they found stone tools that date back. Uh, 130,000 years ago, stone tools that date back 130,000 years ago. And they said this is strong evidence uh, for the earliest seafaring 
in the Mediterranean. Okay. Uh, and they said that this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than a hundred thousand years. Specialists in Stone Age archaeologists say, archaeology say previous artifact discoveries had shown uh, people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands, and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 100,000 years ago. Okay, so the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. And what this is, when these different archaeological discoveries come out, what it's doing is, is causing all the scientists and archaeologists, etc., to push the timelines back, to push the timelines back. OK, you know, Juvenile had that song back in like 1988, 1999, back that thing up. They keep having to back that thing up when these archaeological discoveries come out. There was one that uh, came out in uh, June of 2017 dealing with Morocco. OK. And this deals with how they found remains of Homo sapiens in Morocco that date back. 300,000 to 350,000 years ago, which are the oldest remains of Homo sapiens, modern man. Now, this article here from NBCnews.com, we're older than we thought. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. This is from June 7th, 2017. Modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought, researchers reported Wednesday. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago, which is 100,000 years earlier than scientists have believed until now. New discoveries and new dating methods show that, in fact, many of the bones belong to modern Homo sapiens uh, as far back as 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. The earliest previous Homo sapiens bones date back dated back 195,000 years ago, and that was in Ethiopia. This pushes this timeline back over 100,000 years ago, and uh, 100,000 years uh, prior to 195,000 years ago, uh, or so. It pushes it pushes the timeline back, and what they're realizing now is that Africans migrated out of the Nile Valley region of Africa much earlier than previously thought, okay? Much earlier than previously thought. Now, there was just an, there was just an article that the New York Times had that um, uh, just came out uh, this past week. And this article here, let's see here, if we can pull this up quickly. Um, yeah, this article right here from the New York Times we posted this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network. Uh, study offers new twist in how the first humans evolved. Study offers new twist in how the first humans evolved and is saying that scientists now believe that uh, it, 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 humans didn't evolve just in one uh, area of Africa at one time. Study offers new twist in how the first humans evolved. A new genetic analysis of 290 people suggests that humans emerged at various times and places in Africa. At various times and places in Africa. Now, this is from uh, May 17th, uh, 2023. Okay. And when you uh, look at the article, it talks about the uh, discovery that was made in Morocco that I just showed you. OK, now this article just came out th th uh, this week. Uh, scientists have revealed a surprisingly complex origin of our species, rejecting the long held argument that modern humans arose from one place in Africa during one period in time. By analyzing the genomes of 290 living people, researchers concluded that modern humans descended uh, from at least two populations that coexisted in Africa for a million years, for one million years before emerging in several independent events across the continent. The findings were published on Wednesday in Nature. Now, that's a, a, a popular journal dealing with uh, scientific discoveries, the journal Nature. OK, now right here, 
excavations at the Jebel Irad archaeological site in Morocco, where 300,000 year old fossils that may be the oldest evidence of Homo sapiens were found in 2017. That right there, that the excavation site, that's dealing with the article I just showed you from NBC News. That plays a part in this discovery right here that just came out this past week as well. Pale uh, paleoanthropologists, paleoanthropologists and geneticists have found evidence pointing to Africa as the origin of our species. The oldest fossils that may belong to modern humans dating back as far as 300,000 years have been unearthed there. So, so were the oldest stone tools used by our ancestors. Okay, so they, they're talking about the, um, the uh, excavation site in Morocco. All right. Okay. So give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Hope, hopefully you learned a lot today. Hopefully you like this type of information. Uh, if you learned anything today, you like this type of information, be sure to register for the uh, online history classes that I teach on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. And we're teaching another session a day, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can register for the full, uh, this time around is 14 weeks. You can register for the full 14 week online course. You can go back and watch the previous sessions that are archived because we do them live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. Today's session uh, should be the last session. This would be session number 14 that we do today, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're making today's session a free session when you go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can, read, uh, you can register for the free class session today and, and be sure to register for the full online course that I teach, okay? Uh, because that helps finance this research, that helps support the African History Network, that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, broadcast our Sunday night show, uh, show pay some of the bills, et cetera, all right? And I teach the class on two different digital platforms, so I have to pay each month to teach the class as well. All right, how you all like this type of information? Post your comments here. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Did you learn anything today? Um, in this class, we, we deal some with uh, some different ancient civilizations as well. You know, we talk about the Olmecs and Central uh, in, in New Mexico. Well, not New Mexico, in Mexico, the Olmecs. Uh, and we talk about the Mandinka, Egyptian, uh, Kemetic Olmec connection as well. Um, we deal with... Uh, ancient Kemet and the influence on America from ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, Kemet meaning land of the blacks, one of the original terms of Egypt, also Ta Mary, meaning the beloved land. When you look at the, when you look at the Washington Monument, the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken. How many people knew that? Okay, the Greeks call it an obelisk. We know that um, the teachings from ancient Kemet were helped form the foundation of the teachings in Freemasonry and 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence uh, are Freemasons. Okay. 50 of the 56 signers in the de of the Declaration of Independence, uh, 1776 were Freemasons. George Washington was a Freemason. So there were 1200 Tekanu uh, all throughout ancient Kemet. All right. Today, they're less than uh, 12, somewhere about seven or so. And they've been taken to um, places around the world. They've been taken to like New York City, London, England, uh, Paris, France. Ancient Egyptians called obelisks Tekkenu, and they were used to tell the time in the past. The pinnacles were basically covered uh, in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say that obelisks represented immortality and eternity, and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Now, currently, Cleopatra's Needle is the name given to three ancient Egyptian obelisks, obelisks or Tekkenu, one in New York City, one in London, England, and one in Paris, France. However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. The obelisks in New York and London are carved out of red granite from the quarries of Aswan, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The two obelisks were uh, commissioned by Nesubiti or, or Pharaoh uh, Thutmose III or Per As 
as uh, Dr. Malefe Keti Asante said, was the uh, original term that we would use. Um, Nasubiti would be a term uh, as well. Uh, Nasubiti Thutmose the third for the Temple of the Sun in Heliopolis near modern day Cairo with each weighing about 224 tons and standing 68 feet tall. So there was a good article from facetofaceafrica.com from May 17, 2022, um, about a year ago, called Cleopatra's Needle, How Three Ancient Egyptian Obelisks Ended Up in New York City, London, and Paris. Okay, and the, the Tekken is a symbol that comes from the story of Asar Aset and Heru, now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, uh, who are also known as the first holy trinity. Uh, there were approx approximately 1,200 Tekkenu built in ancient Kemet, but only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few people know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar, Asar who the Greeks called Osiris, who you see depicted here in the middle, uh, stooping down, okay? Asar, Aset, and Heru. And Heru was born of a virgin birth on December 25th to the virgin Osset, and it's going to be from Osset and Heru that we get the story of the black Madonna and child that was worshipped all throughout Europe, including in France, because there's about uh, 300 depictions of the black Madonna and child in France. Renoko Rashidi talks about this in his book, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe. From the black Madonna and child, we get the decolorized version. Uh, in the story of the white Mary and Jesus, the decolorized version. But you have to understand where that all comes from. Okay, now somebody asked a question uh, about the class. So we have the information on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Let me go back to it. So the, the, uh, tw uh, the full online course is on sale, uh, $60.00. That's a $300 value because they're going to be uh, five free lectures that you get from me also that, that will be in the video library. So when you scroll down our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, we have the information right here. So on sale, $60, regularly $130. And next class is today, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm about to get out of here to get ready for a uh, class. And we'll have a free class session today, but uh, you can register for the full 12 week online course. Click here to register for the full 12 week online course. Um, your membership, your registration in the class does not expire, meaning you can go back and watch. You'll, you'll have full access to watch the class, you know, next year, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, it doesn't expire. You, you still have full access. You can go back and watch as many times as you want to. Uh, we have a bundle pack where you get you can register for both classes for $80. The second class I teach is on Sunday, and we'll be teaching the class Sunday, May 21st. Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. The same format for the second class as well. We do the class live. The sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. You don't have to worry about being in class at a certain time or anything like that, okay? And we have a live chat where you can, a text chat where you can ask questions in class also. If you've missed class, you can email me to ask your questions as well, okay? All right, but this is, um, hopefully you learned a lot. This is a lot of work to teach these classes, to do this broadcast, because um, I don't I do not do, I was doing this full-time, I don't, I don't do this full-time anymore. Uh, so it takes, you know, I, and I do my radio show. I do Roland Martin's show on Fridays. Usually I'm on Faraji Muhammad's show on, on Tuesdays. Um, and then, you know, I, I do other interviews as well. Uh, and people and if people interview me and they're requesting interviews. Uh, I'm going to be on the road during the summer. It looks like uh, I'll be at least a few places in the summer and I'll be here in Detroit at different events also. So I stay busy. 
and my my radio show is on every Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. the Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. Now, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun, mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue uh, light, the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light, light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees, in a series of steps or degrees. This comes from page 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Brown. And I just interviewed Tony about four weeks ago. And we were talking about uh, why Nile Valley contribute, why, why Nile Valley civilization uh, matters, why Nile, Nile Valley civilization history matters. And we talked about Queen Cleopatra a little bit as well. Um, the concept of going to an institution of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of steps or degrees comes out of Africa, that comes out of the Nile, the Nile Valley region of Africa, especially ancient Kemet. That comes from us, okay? What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So this is the type of information that changes the way we think, feel, act, and behave, and, act, and ultimately changes our results. It has a transformational impact on our mindset when we come into the knowledge of this and we combine African history with economic empowerment and political empowerment, okay? When you, you see that pyramid principle that I show you that Dr. Linda Jeffries and Professor James Small talk about, I'll show that to you in just a minute. Now, Masonic temples are considered houses of light or temples of learning. The term Mason means child of light, okay? And the term Mason is a direct reference to the highest degree of the ancient Kemetic education system. The 33 degrees of instruction within Freemasonry represent a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprise the ancient Kemetic or ancient Egyptian system of education. Yet, with less than 10% of the wisdom of ancient Kemet, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. They learned less than 10% of what the ancient Africans knew and they've been able to basically conquer the world. This comes from page 33 of Egypt on the Potomac by uh, Tony Browder. All right, so we go through our history um, and we uh, look at different periods of history. We look at uh, understanding what our, what our patron saints, um, we look at, uh, we go through history chronologically, okay? We look at the uh, Moorish influence on Europe. Even when we look at something like center class and center class or uh, who, who it, it, center class is Dutch, um, it is St. Nicholas. Center class means St. Nicholas. And center class is the religious figure that, the secular figure of Santa Claus is based upon. But center class had a sidekick named Joie de Piet, Black Pete, and Black Pete was a Moor. And in one of the versions of the story, Black Pete was center class's slave, okay? Some people may say servant, but he was he was defeated by center class and became, it became his slave. So we go through, look at things like, why December 20, why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th? Because nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. And that's that deals with the winter solstice and a retelling of uh, ancient stories dealing with Asar, Aset, and Heru, uh, different things of this nature. Okay. And then we look at the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. 
we look at different um uh, civilizations like that of uh, carthage okay different empires like that of carthage the carthaginians hannibal barca uh we look at nubia as well axum uh etc we deal with the film black panther okay because uh the for instance the, you know black panther represents you see 11 different african cultures infused in the movie black panther uh ruth carter was the costume designer ruth carter uh studied 11 different african cultures for six months and we see this represented in the film uh black panther bast the panther deity uh bast is is based upon bastet uh bastet was a netter uh who uh was worshipped in the form of a lioness okay she was an african egyptian goddess worshipped in the form of a lioness and later a cat and she was a, a netter of warfare in lower lower kemet lower egypt she was worshipped as early as the second dynasty around 2890 bce before the common era or bc okay so the film Black Panther is a powerful movie, the first one and the second one. There's so much African culture and history uh, that we see represented in the movie. Um, and then we, we go through and we look at uh, the Moors going into Europe as well in 711 AD and who are the Moors and the impact that the African Moors had on Europe and what they're taking into Europe. George G.M. James in the book Stolen Legacy said that the Moors were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. And the teachings that the Moors take into Europe are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. These are some actual slides from the class uh, that I teach. So I put the, I created all the slides, I put together the curriculum for both classes. Um, I've been studying history a long time. We talk about 711 AD, General Tariq ibn Ziyad uh, goes in and conquers um, uh, Spain, what, what the Iberian Peninsula, and the Moors are going to settle in the southern portion of what would today we call Spain, okay? And he's going to, um, uh, he and his cavalry, they're going to um, conquer, uh, they go into the Spanish city of Toledo, um, and they are going to end the European dominance of the Iberian Peninsula because it's under the control of the Vandals and the Visigoths at this time. This is who he's, he's fighting against, especially the Visigoths. This is who he's fighting against and uh, defeating. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll deal with the uh, deal with the history of the Moors, and we'll see how the transatlantic slave trade evolves uh and it starts with the portuguese and then we see the spanish are right behind them and we're going to see that christopher columbus greatly extends the transatlantic slave trade and because of his four voyages and the territory that he conquers and these areas that he conquers have never recovered from being conquered over 500 years ago by spain okay uh he goes into the Bahamas, uh, Cuba, Hispaniola, the western third of the island of Hispaniola is where Haiti is. Uh, he goes into the West Indies, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Trinidad, Venezuelan mainland, South America, uh, Panama, Honduras, etc. Okay, so we see the conquering of the Taino and the Arawaks, things of this nature, the conquering of of the Saboni, the conquering of these uh, of these Native Americans in these areas like Jamaica and uh, uh, Hispaniola. We're going to see Africans being brought in to these areas around 1501 or so. Um, and then we're going to see the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade with the Asiento de Negros of, of 1518 signed by King Charles V, okay, also known as King Charles I. Uh, and the role that Bartolomeu de las Casas plays, who was a bishop who traveled with Columbus on many of his voyages, Bartolomeu de las Casas, okay, 
and the importation of black slaves to work in the Americas was the inspiration of the Spanish Bishop Ptolemy de las Casas, whose support of black slavery was motivated by humanitarian concerns. He wasn't necessarily concerned about the Africans, even though he is going to regret his decision to recommend that the Africans be enslaved. Uh, he is going to um, regret that decision and work the rest of his life to end the slave trade. But it's a little too late. It's a little too late now. It's, it's, it's exploded. African slaves were first brought to the New World shortly after its discovery by Christopher Columbus or uncovery, unconquering. Um, upon his arrival in the Bahamas, Columbus himself captured seven of the natives for their education, quote unquote, their education on his return to Spain. However, the slave trade proper only began in 1518 when the first black cargo direct from Africa landed in the West Indies. So when they when they look at 1518, they're talking about the Asiento de Negros signed by King Charles V. OK, now. The transatlantic slave trade goes back to 1441, then start in 1518. But some timelines or some maps that you look at will look at 1518 as a starting point. They're really trying to, they're really trying to, I would argue they're trying to minimize the severity of the damage and 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 try to cut out about 60 years of the transatlantic slave trade. Bartolome de las Casas argued that the enslavement of Africans and even of some whites, proving that in the early period, slavery did not operate according to exclusive racial demarcations, would save the indigenous Amerindian populations, which were not only dying out, but engaging in large scale resistance as they opposed their excessively harsh conditions. As a result, King Charles V, King of Spain, agreed to the Asiento de Negros or slave trading license of 1518. He signed this August of 1518, which later represented the most coveted prize in European wars as it gave to those who possessed it a monopoly in slave trading. You can't talk about the transatlantic slave trade and not talk about the Asiento de Negros. How many people have never heard of the Asiento? How many people have never heard of Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas. You can't talk about the transatlantic slave trade and not, and, not, and, and not talk about the Asiento. This is just a fraction of the type of information that I deal with in these online courses that I teach, that I put together the curriculum, I put together the content, develop the slides, all of this, okay? So if you learned anything today, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can use this information with your children, use this with your family. Register for the online courses right now. We have the bundle pack for only $80. You get this class and my second class that I teach on Sundays, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. And we'll see you in class today, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, uh, and also you can support the African History Network. Another way, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Um, so we have the information right on the homepage of our website as well. And remember, uh, so this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. I'll be on the road some this summer, um, speaking in different cities or um, expos, et cetera. So I'm trying to line that up as well. So this helps cover expenses, uh, things of that nature, all right? So if you learned anything today, um, definitely support us. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Uh, Wakanda forever. And uh, we'll see you in class today, and I'll see you on the radio. When I'm on Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Talk to you next.